Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me quickly invite our very esteemed panel to take this forward. Please put your hands together as I invite onto the stage President Stales Imami Manish Gupta. Mr. Gupta, I request that you kindly take your seat. Please put your hands together as I invite Senior VP of Zydus, Lalit Ahuja. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Ahuja. This was sir. Please keep the applause going as I invite onto the stage VP Digital Acceleration Officer, Coca-Cola India and SWA, Ambuj Singh. A very warm welcome to you, Mr. Singh. Thank you for joining us. And please keep it going as I invite COO and EVP of Diageo India, Ashish Parikh. And one more time, let's hear it up for the moderator of the session, co-founder and CEO of salesco.ai, Ranjit Kumar. First, let me welcome Ashish, Ambuj, Lalit and Manish. I think for the audience, we'll talk more as we go, but I think they couldn't have been a better panel to discuss about sales, the transformation in sales, what AI is up and what EB2B that we are talking about. So we have a great panel which has an extraordinary expertise on the topics that we're going to talk. So let's give a great round of applause for the panel first. As I start, I just wanted to share with you quick thoughts on what AI is doing since we've been talking about AI. So when we say that AI is really transforming the capabilities or human capabilities, we are also looking at how the role of sales rep is going to change, how the role of a retailer is going to change. And all of this is happening so fast that in the next three years, we see that most of the things that we're using right now may be done in a very, very different way. So again, like I said, we may not have all the answers right now, but there are people who are exploring such boundaries, exploring a lot of things which are happening. Something is leading to some formation, something is still in progress, and we are here to find few thoughts, ideas on which we can build and delve upon. That's the purpose of this panel discussion. So with that, let me start with Manish first. Uh, so Manish has been uh, in uh, sales for good about 25 years. 29. 29 <laughs> years. He's been uh, the most veteran in sales in, and working with top global companies like Reket, heading Imami as president of sales right now. Uh, we used to carry a pen and paper, right? A customer book, a log sheet, release sheets. It was all pen and paper, right? Life was a lot more simpler. We used to do our whatever data collection once in a month, you know, do those acetates and everything stuff. And the only person who knew that what is the month end sales was the ASM, right? Nobody else in the company knew what had happened, how the month has closed. The realization came only a week later that what really happened. Today, of course, things have changed. I mean, you know, minute by minute, your boss knows what's happening. And uh, I think some for the good, some actually not so good because uh, there is so much proliferation of data, you know, with all the SFA and DMS sort of stuff which has come in. We guys are watching every soldier, every person on the ground every minute, right? So there's like tons and tons of data. But is it really fundamentally now becoming a data overload and are we really putting used to it? Are all those tools which we have all created making the life of the uh, the sales rep really faster, smoother, easier? Is it leading to more lines in the store? Is it really leading to that sales uplift we keep talking about? Is coming under a question now, right? So, so pen to paper has gone, lots of automation, lots of mobile on the, on the ground. But I think uh, what we are missing is not using that data for the person who is making that call. Uh, it's not making a difference. I think somewhere it's, it's plateauing. It's uh, stagnating. We are still fighting with zero growths and single digit growths. And, and that I think is something which needs to be addressed. So I'm like going beyond your question brief. 
No, but that's yeah, right. everything is changed from a from a way of working perspective. So good, thank you. I think that was uh, a good capturing of where it has transitioned from, where it is right now, and is it really addressing the core challenge of sales reps? And to build upon that, in a similar question, and also to build upon as a follow-up question, I'll uh, ask from Lalit. Lalit has been heading sales uh, for Zydus for quite almost a decade now, and he has a distinction of working with companies like Mars, GCP, Dabur, practically a uh, lot of these top uh, CPG companies and had a really diverse experience on uh, what's going on in sales. I'd want to understand what do you think in terms of technology, what are the challenges which is still not been addressed? So while technology has been there for the let's say 15, 20 years that we've been talking about 10 years more effectively, but the challenges which not been addressed by technology so far according to you which still is not making the life easier for sales reps. From a CPG context, you know, a lot of us talk about how is the technology helping us either sell more or sell to more, broadly, those two buckets. In fact, we were talking about it in our own leadership team some time back. How many of these platforms that a lot of us use, whether it's SFA or DMS or BI, are actually having the either the shopper or the customer at the heart of it. What does Ramesh General Store actually need to maximize his profitability or his business? Right? If you think of it from that perspective, most technologies today are, and uh, with all respect to what they have done, because that's always a journey, right? Maybe somebody will answer that question. We have seen some glimpses of it. Is there a technology that can help answer that question to a seller at a storefront that if I do this, this, this today, I will make life uh, that much better for my customer because it's somewhere attending to the needs of the shopper, adoption of technology by a seller, right? Uh, even today, and I can certainly talk about organizations where I have worked, you, you, you do all the concept advocacy around it, you tell them how it will make their life simpler, how it will make them earn maybe incentives, Maybe for somebody else, recognition is a, is a thing to look forward. There is always this factor, if I can use the word fear factor in a seller's mind, right? I'll, and I can and, you know, narrate an anecdote, I'm sure all of us will relate to it. I was talking to one of my salesmen when we launched an app about two years back and we told him everything about it. He said, sir, it's all right, but you put me on satellite. Yeah. Right? That was his interpretation that basically yeah. what you're doing is now tracking me. This problem cannot be solved by technology alone. It's also the organization's prerogative or you know, responsibility to address that fear factor in how do they feel more empowered versus more monitored, right? How do they feel more enabled versus more sort of tutored at a store level? And what can sales organizations and technology do to address that? Those are the two things I think I can you know, share his thoughts uh, with all of us. In that, yeah. Actually, we have picked up in our research when we do our dipstick, and uh, it's there as a part of our experience center where we put in certain anecdotes which sales rep said, says, which is almost exactly. And since Ambuj has been there, so he didn't seen, Manish has seen. So, uh, you know, sales reps say that I use SFA because companies want me to use SFA. I don't need it, one. Secondly, he says that I use it because my boss needs data and he wants to look at what I'm doing, right? So the whole uh, thing that am I feeling empowered just does not come across. No sales rep says that this is helping me drive my day-to-day -day sales. That's point number one from a sales point of view, which is so important, right? And what you said is even a bigger point that, okay, let's say a few companies, you know, certain companies like us are still thinking about sales rep. Are we really thinking about the customer, right? So let's say most of the automation, recommendations, all of that we do is to help the sales rep sell better to the customer, which is retailer here. Who is thinking about what a retailer wants beyond a point, right? So that's a very, very valid question. And I'm sure a lot of things that are happening and we have uh, Ambuj here, we'll talk about what we are doing in that domain along with partnerships from Coke and what other learnings which Ambuz will have on answering some of these questions. So we'll talk about that. But before I come to this topic of customer, I'll still have a few more questions on 
solving the problem of sales reps. And we'll go to Ashish, a CEO for an EVP for Diageo. And again, he's been working in different geographies, different regions, had an extensive experience across different FMCG company, including Reket in his previous stint. And uh, his current uh, organization has a different, relatively different way of selling than a regular CPG, where actually the role of sales rep even becomes more important. And it's not a very transactional role the way it is for uh, a regular CPG company. So uh, maybe Ashish, if you can throw some light on, uh, how do you see the role of sales reps in the industry that you have worked with off late, though you have worked with CPG industry across different domains, with the emergence of new technologies that you may be seeing around, yeah? Uh, thanks, Ranjit, for having me. So, well, uh, just to set the context, uh, you know, for the alcohol industry, we just have 80,000 outlets in India compared to 8 million outlets in consumer, you know, industry. So, for us, you know, every outlet is like a, can imagine, you know, because we are selling billions of dollars of revenue just from these 80,000 stores. And uh, so what happens is, and the amount of SQs that are there in each store is outrageous, you know, the amount of uh, beer to, you know, whites, if you look at vodkas, gins, whiskeys, you know, and with, within whiskeys you'll have international whiskeys, malls, super deluxe whiskeys, and then there's tequilas. Everything under the sun sells through the same store. And uh, if you can imagine the role of the salesman in, because each state, because liquor is a state subject, each state has a very different, uh, you know, RTM, right? So with that, the role of the salesman is really not about only selling, it goes much more into demand generation because what we see uh, in the store is, you know, you are releasing anyway a lot of time of the salesman through a lot of this. So we are, using the time to actually change the way we are, you know, exciting our consumers to drive gen demand generation. So we do a lot of, you know, recognition. It is image recognition, AI-led recognition to tell you where the planogram should be, if it's in the right location or not. You know, if it's not in the right location, what quickly you need to do to put it in the right location. What are the kind of POSMs you have executed in the store? What are the kind of POSMs competition executed? So is your share of visibility better or worse? You know, is the share of activations better or worse? So if you go to a, a bar, you know, our key account manager should tell you in the back bar, you know, we are better off or worse, worse off in terms of our market share and what's the menu listing or what's the activation happening in the outlet. So is there a tent card? Is there everything? So the role both for a sales as well as a key account for us has shifted from selling to better merchandising, better category, you know, creation. We do a lot of focus time on innovation. So we say if we just don't launch Don Julio, which is the world's biggest tequila in India. So we are saying, what can you do better with a Don Julio, you know, in terms of portraying the liquid, you know, uh, in terms of the product being the hero, can you put it in the right location? How will the consumer interact with it? What are the best serves you can do through through your own tech that you have? Because we have a lot of tech that the salesman has or the key account manager has. So we have kind of used this whole thing into a very different dimension, moving from sales to more demand generation, uh, you know, Ranjit. I think that's, that's really important and really happy to see. And since obviously your business hinges on certain key customers. So naturally, knowing about those drivers becomes very, very important in your industry and maybe it has evolved in a relatively better than other industries. But the key question still remains, which Lalit raised, that we still keep thinking about the sales reps and how they can sell better in a store. Do we even care about what the store wants? Now, this question having worked in different organizations and having seen the transition and also, you know, as we work with different organizations, the moment we talk about what a customer wants or giving that liberty or empowerment to the customer, there is a huge pushback from the sales team. As if your sales will not happen if you allow the retailer to buy, right? So the moment we talk about something which is empowering the retailer and making a choice, unilaterally every time I have seen that people say, Fir to sales nahi hoga. 
as if, and I have been challenging this in different ways, I say, okay, one time a retailer may buy because the, you have a relation, because you have shown some desperation some point in time, or maybe because he wants to oblige you, but can he keep buying just because you have a relation, right? But because the sales is a very hardcore relationship driven, let's say, profession, so we maybe somewhere we over index relation and we believe that everything is happening because of relation. Now, since, and, and I've been questioning this for a long time, uh, you know, when I was heading sales uh, for my previous organization, but now I can say over the last few years that I can see that there is a valid proof that if you allow the customers to buy, things changes for good and it doesn't bounce back the way you expect that they will stop buying. Because ultimately a retailer is buying for himself to fulfill the demand which is there in the store. He's not obliging a sales rep or a company by buying that, right? Obviously there's an initial push and so and so forth. Now when I'm saying that over the last few years I'm seeing some validation of this theory that yes, this works and uh, this is, you know, demonstrated at scale with certain company, by certain companies uh, here in India and outside the world by actually giving that empowerment to the retailers, which is through EB2B. Now, there's a lot of ups and downs which has happened in the EB2B industry as we see right now over the last five years. Almost every company has tried and almost every company has failed. And a lot of companies have tried with us and failed. But there are only four companies in the world who have succeeded in EB2B. And still most of them I see as skeptics and 20 issues, why it doesn't happen. And there are issues. I'm not saying there are no issues, right? W which is AB InBev globally, Unilever, ITC here in India, and Coke globally in multiple markets. And thankfully we have representation from Coke here, uh, Ambuj, who has been uh, the front face for leading the EB2B in India, especially in Southwest Asia, for Coca-Cola. And uh, the way Coke has demonstrated the adoption of EB2B has surprised me multifold because like I said, I have seen companies succeeding, I have seen companies failing. And I never expected that a company can so fast execute a new technology at scale with millions of stores and with metric which will surprise you. So when we talk about whether the sales goes down if a retailer is making a choice, the answer is already that it doesn't. The answer is it increases. And for that, I have Ambuj, who will share more thoughts on uh, the whole transformation which uh, he's been a part of uh, Coca-Cola system of how it has shaped up and how it is shaping up, yeah? We are a system which is built for scale and you've been part of it, so you, you, you know it. Uh, and I was looking at some numbers only before walking in. Uh, we were somewhere around close to 40,000 outlets onboarded on EB2B same month in August last year. Now we are a little over 800,000 and we are adding more. So we see there is always a customer adoption, but it does not happen only by chance. You have to have customer at the center of it. As long as it's customer centric, it is solving for something that the customer needs. Uh, and you keep building on that particular premise. But of course, it also has to link back to what your salesman uh, uh, would want, what the company objectives are, and so on. So before the scale-up or rapid, uh, rapid scale-up happened, I'm talking from experience, we also went through a lot of learning. Learning, not just learning, we, it also started off with some failures. We also went through our own, own uh, 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 hit and trial uh, method as well. First thing that we learned was, it has to solve for customer, it has to be customer centric. And that is what is helping us grow at scale. Second is, once you're solving for the customer, what is the business objective that you are trying to achieve or the company is trying to achieve? In some cases, some of the failures that we saw recently as well are not scaled to that extent was also because what do you go for? Do you go for valuation? Do you go for value creation? For CPG company, it's always to go for value creation and help you sell your product more. So that's what uh, uh, we actually learned and we went for. And then once you're clear with the customer centricity and then business model, then you start designing the product, the technology, 
the capability gaps, both tech as well as human. And then comes the toughest part, which is change management. In India, and also in, in, in Southwest Asia, uh, but more in India, what we noticed was the customer, or the outlet in our case, was more happy to adopt. We were slower to change, or we were, the rate of adoption at the outlet level is higher than the rate of change internally that we had. Uh, but thankfully, we have, we have partners who believed in it, who had seen, who, had, who believed in the benefit of it, and stayed behind it. From a customer centricity point of view, we, and I'm just quoting a few things that we, we noticed, we, were also, we also thought that, you know, till the time you don't give a monetary benefit for the customer over and above what he or she is getting offline, they might not go for it. But we were surprised, simple things like, Transparency of pricing was a big one in, 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 they felt empowered. Second simple thing like, even, you know, he does not control, the outlet does not control when the salesman will visit. So he, he or she is in a hurry at that point in time. So the timing of order, he's empowered to order when so the convenience factor, convenience factor. Transparency, convenience, and of course, service has to be top notch. So your, your both digital service and your delivery service has to be uh, top notch. And these simple things also help you drive a lot of adoption. Yes, initially when we went in, there were apprehensions uh, with, with sales team thinking, what will my role be? And to some extent, while they're, they're uh, uh, I mean, to your point, do they see that as a satellite over them or do they feel empowered? We also see that they are also learning because they see all this happening around them. So they, they want to move fast in adopting such technologies which will help them grow. Not just in the, in the current roles that they are doing, but even, even. So I think a combination of leadership belief, combination of customer centricity, a combination of what's happening in the universe around you helped us scale fast. Great. Thank you, Ambuj. If I were to tell you uh, or ask you to pick one, what is the biggest reason do you think, if at all EB2E succeeds, why does it succeed? And if there is one reason for that. Sorry, no, I'm saying uh, if I were to ask you, you gave three reasons, right, uh, for success of EB2B. If I were to ask you, what is the biggest reason for success of EB2B, the number one reason? Number one is customer uh, uh, centricity and customer benefit. Right, so belief of the company in making it all transparent and giving empowerment to the customer, which is what where we started from, which was Lalit's point. So, uh, Lalit, since you raised this point, and uh, EB2B is at advanced stage, mature stage with certain companies, early stage with certain companies, non-existent for certain companies, what is your take on what you could hear about maybe EB2B and how it is transforming? Do you see that shaping up in some form? We don't know what form exactly may come, right? Eventually, we are seeing a form where a retailer will become more empowered. In, in a certain way, Manish was exposed to a certain situation where distribution was happening differently than the regular part. So, any take you have on that? Yeah, so I think it's, I mean, uh, you know, no, nothing in stop in area whose time has come. So, EB2B is uh, on its way. Some organizations have taken the lead well and truly. Uh, honestly, we are probably a notch behind it. And uh, probably that's one takeaway from this, uh, you know, um, fraternity meet that I'm here on. Uh, just two things as I think forward. Uh, again, thinking about retailers, right? A lot of us have spent many, many years just spending hours and hours and hours talking to retailers and then you start to think, what does this guy really want from this tool or from this technology? Uh, and I'm a novice in that, so pardon my naivety, but what I'm wondering is how many of the current platforms today are essentially, in simple terms, assortment ordering tools versus how many of these tools today uh, help him make an intelligent decision on what to order. And now compare this to what's happening today, you know, in the other channels, which is e-commerce, also modern trade, right? A lot of the success of those channels, other than obviously convenience and a whole lot of things which we all know about, is an e-commerce player would know essentially what's the right assortment at each dark store. Yep. Eventually, they're getting yep. there. 
and that's one big reason for success. And today, if you talk to retailers, one of their in pain points amongst many, many others, is that we don't know what the demand will come. So a customer comes, he asks for something, yeah. and, and that hurts him like anything, right? In any case, life today is tough for them. So every dime of uh, you know, value is lost is painful. Now, what I'm thinking is, uh, and like I said, I'm a novice, so if there are tools doing it, it's great, but can that tool, just like the sales rep tool is helping him sell intelligently, how many of these tools can help him buy intelligently? Predictive demand, what's going to happen in and around my neighborhood? There is a festival seven days later. Yep. Can that be built in into my predictive demand and you know things like that? I'm sure people on the technical side and the business side have thought about it. I'm just placing probably a very uh, simple thought on the table. And the second one I think is, uh, is a bit provocative, which is that how many e-B2B tools the retailer handle eventually? If yeah. I have one, Manish has one, yes. Ambuj has one, and so does Ashish, how many will he handle? Yep. And therefore, uh, and this is where it gets a bit provocative, is there going to be a point in time for a unified platform for him? Yep. Because See, you have to think about him, not the company. Eventually, if something has to succeed. Yeah. Is there something that can happen? And I know there is non-compete and compliance and everything that has to be thought through. But make life simple for him for you to succeed. Is there, is there a case eventually for a platform which is unified across whichever organizations he chooses to engage with? You don't force that on him. And I think that's where... So look, another example. Uh, DMS, uh, early days of DMS, 15, 20 years back, what would most of our distributors tell us? I already have a system. Yep. There's another company already has a system. Up the stuff software up lagayenge. How do I manage all this? Yeah. Right. And that's still an unsolved issue actually. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Huh? But somehow it's managing. Yeah. Because it's, a, it's the, the number of organizations there is lesser. Three, four, five yeah. firms to deal with. Retailer has I don't know hundred. So that's the other thing uh, which uh, is on my mind. So the tool is here to stay. I mean, it's just going to get more bigger and better. But Futuristically speaking, these are probably the two, uh, you know, uh, solves all of us have to put our mind to. No, I think again, great point, uh, Lalit. So, two points you raised and since we have been, and Ambuj is also here and thankfully ITC team is also here, who has been leading this way. So, very valid point. So, first point is, is it making the retailer or helping the retailer make an intelligent choice? So, it is. So, both of these systems, whether it is enabled with our technology in terms of predictions or some company specific, all the EB2B at scale that we are talking about, even Unilever or Web, each one of them are equivalent to any kind of Amazon or a Zomato or Swiggy in terms of intelligence or more. Why I am saying intelligence or more is because, see, uh, you still have transaction data of a retailer, right? S um, Amazon does not have all of your transaction data. You may be dealing with multiple platforms, right? But a retailer to buy your company is only buying from, largely, unless he buys something from a wholesaler, right? He's buying from you, from you. So from a machine learning, let's say, intelligent prediction point of view, the behavior adoption point of view, actually the prediction is as good as 60, 70% accuracy. And actually when we are saying that it is driving a retailer to buy more, it is driving a retailer to buy more because there are relevant SKUs that he is able to see and you'll be surprised, without quoting numbers to a specific company and all the companies that we are talking about here, their average order value increases by about 30% when it is a self-order. Each of the retailer who have adopted have ordered more SKUs, at least 20 to 30% more SKUs which they never bought earlier. So while we believe that there is a warm body which is required to sell, we have experienced that a retailer given a choice is buying more new products. He's buying more, let's say, cross-sell products and it is proven with data. Maybe Ambuj can talk a little more about that. So, uh, for retailer, what he knows is what he has been buying and selling. So that knowledge is already there, there with him. He also knows what the customers or shoppers are coming to his store and asking for and probably it does a mix in his own mind and with whatever data that he has, he does that calculation and he's able to order and also with the help of, of course, the salesman. But on the tool or on the app, he's getting all this already because that's, that's in his base somewhere, buying pattern, how much he buys, when he buys. But you can build a lot more intelligence as well. What he doesn't know is what 
the store in his vicinity is buying. What he doesn't know is what are the new launches and what all campaigns companies are running. So I can actually now link my marketing campaign and say that, okay, in this vicinity, in a, in, in a residential society, this, this kind of a brand and a pack is, is being pushed and I am running a consumer campaign over there. That goes into the retailer's prediction as well. And all that is happening currently. Uh, it's already live. So all that helps you sell more. Uh, coming to a very important question, and we don't have an answer for it, how many apps will the retailer have at the end of it? Uh, frankly, that's, that's one of the first questions or many questions that we face even when we go to, go to new markets, and I don't have an answer. But experience so far tells that it is not just the app. It is the overall package of service delivery. So, for example, if he's ordering on my Coke Buddy app, that's our e B2B uh, uh, tool, and does not get the service, then that app is useless for Coke. So I have to meet the basic, it's, it's, a, it's a full bundle package deal. Tomorrow, will there be consolidation? Yes, maybe. Will there be no consolidation? I can't say, but I will never know if I don't start. And what if tomorrow there is consolidation, but I had not started? Right. So I don't have a chance in any case. So I'm making, I'm ruling myself out of that chance before I start. So it's very important. I mean, the way we saw it, it was very important for us to start and scale and give that benefit to the customer as soon as uh, 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 possible. Uh, but I, as, as I said, there is a complete package. All of us also have multiple apps for a similar solution while most of us will use Amazon to order, but we'll also have Flipkart. There are two food service aggregators. Most of us will have both food service aggregator app uh, uh, over here and use them. So all that, ultimately, you have to provide the right choice to the customer, and customer is king and will decide whether to keep that app or not. Yeah. So I just, think, just to sorry, add, please. You yeah. know, add to what you're saying, see, the, uh, the interesting thing is with the amount of geopolitical events and the natural you know, every day some disruptions that are happening. There is no way you're going to have a, you know, a very steady state sales force. You will need these kind of platforms. So tomorrow there's a riot or there is just a heat wave. We've advised our salesmen not to go when we've seen 50 degrees, you know, kind of centigrades. There's been crazy rains, crazy calamities, or there are buns in a lot of cities. The point is EB2B is going to be always an alternative option and why would it really doesn't surprise me if you're going to get more sales when the person is browsing because I myself buy much more when I browse on my own. You know, all of us, whether you look at Amazon or you go to a, even a key account when you're browsing on your own, you end up buying much more than what you had planned for. Yeah, so you got the time, you got the convenience, so salesman sar pe khada nahi hai or the salesman sar pe khade nahi hai, payment nahi puch rahe, ye nahi puch rahe. So you are in your own piece and you are then checking out all the assortment and suddenly you realize, okay, this SQ I did not buy, this, this is something interesting I'd like to buy, this is a larger pack I'd like to buy, which is not in my store. So you, if you are getting 30% uptick, I am really not surprised. Because, you know, it just browsing on your own is always the best thing yeah. to do. You end up watching more movies also on an Amazon, you know, when you are doing, so, because it will give you your own assortment yeah. out there and you end up consuming much more in a Netflix or an Amazon, which is uh, so much different, uh, you know, than what you had planned to, right? So true. And to yes. some extent, see that many to many buying already is happening. To believe that my distributor, my salesman is making all the sales in a shop, that's not the truth anymore. The guy is anyway on a many to many buying. So he just, and you're right, I mean, when you look at attrition numbers across sales teams, 30 to 50 percent attrition is a given these days for the front line. Yeah. Which means, if I were to look at my numbers, assume it's at 40, every, every second salesperson making a call at that store is a new guy and he doesn't know anything about the store, right? So the store knows more about itself than what we give the credit to our salesmen at times. Yep. And that, I think, is the foundation why companies need to move to E2B2B to B2B very quickly. Because uh, I believe a lot of us had the same question to ourselves as a consumer that how many apps do we operate? I mean, I see at my home, there are eight apps on my wife's phone, about 10 on my kid's phone, 10 on mine, and we're all buying food and grocery. Yeah. 
right? And we are all somehow surviving with it. Yeah. So, so there is there is definitely uh, some scare, but there is also a merit in believing that you start the journey. The faster you start, the higher the chances that you will stick around being one of those apps. The later you start, the yeah. less of the chances, right? Yeah. So, yes. So, no, thank you, thank you. I think it's been a really interesting discussion and just to close on this because we are up with time. So, uh, uh, two uh, things which we would leave it with. So, one is uh, that sales rep needs to be empowered. Yeah. Technology is for them and they should not be working for technologies. Thankfully, with new te age technologies, we are almost there because these things genuinely work to help us and augment our competencies, point number one. And secondly, to the question that whether EB2B and, and very valid question I've been hearing for the last five years of whether EB2B, how many apps will have, uh, how many apps, uh, you know, a customer can really deal with. And Ambud said it very rightfully, we don't know that, we don't have answer to that. The point is, who will survive? And you also said, Manish, who will survive? People who are in the game will survive, point number one. Secondly, everybody may not be in the game or cannot be in the game because if you do not have a huge portfolio, you may not have that bandwidth to really operate on that scale. Eventually, the way we see, and it is already happening in the world uh, with a lot of large companies who have large deployment of EB2B, they have started aggregating, market, making it as a marketplace. So we predict that in the next three to five years, we'll have single principle marketplace. So if it is X company, Obviously, they will have some non-compete stuff, but 20 companies can get in that. I was in uh, Jakarta last last week. Uh, the biggest cigarette player of Jakarta has launched a big marketplace uh, called Sampurna. I, every FMCG company that I met was aware of that and they were already working on that, right? Coke in multiple markets are trying different bottlers of Coke. I have seen that they are trying marketplace model. AB InBev has demonstrated EB2B marketplace and uh, their last report was they have done 1.5 billion dollars of transaction on their marketplace. They have partnered with more than 200 brands. So this is shaping up right now. We will have these forms and shapes appearing in a way which will make it more visible, more logical, more doable. But yes, it's an exciting time for things to change from sales, route to market, distribution, all of things that we have been a part of the last 20, 30 years. And I'm quite sure that we'll be the change agents for, for taking the whole industry to the future. With that, I'll uh, really thank all of you for your time and looking forward to meeting next time. Really thank you for that.